Hello, everyone. We are talking with uh, Margaret Barber. Uh, she is from the Port of Coos Bay. She is talking about how Coos Bay is converting um, from a break bulk port to providing container capabilities. I am Kim Daniels. I am the CEO of Mercantile Logistics. We are a customs brokerage house, and we help companies uh, find the best ways to move their transportation uh, needs. Um, so one of the things that we do is we reach out to these uh, these locations in these regions and Coos Bay is such a great region for providing, uh, you know, a location for a lot of the congestion problems that we are experiencing right now because those congestion problems are not going to um, be ever gone. So we're going to see them in the future. And Coos Bay is taking up the, the helm to try to help relieve those as well as provide some better export services using their rail system. So with that, let's go ahead and start uh, into our interview. Um, Margaret, thank you for being here. Um, Thanks, Kim. I, uh, I really appreciate it. I think this is going to be a very fun discussion. Um, so I think I want to talk about first the history and I'm going to go ahead and share if I if you'll let me share my screen. I am going to share my screen about the history <laughs> and this great picture you have here of Coos Bay. Okay, yeah, so that's um, our waterfront down along the bay years and years ago, obviously. Um, so in terms of history of the port, um, the port was established in 1912 um, and you know over that period of time, we really were focused um, as an export port. We were at one point the largest timber port in the world. Um, that has kind of dropped off a little bit as far as volumes. We used to have um, about 360 ship calls a year um, serving the, the timber industry. Now we do about 60 ship calls a year. Um, one of the things that makes the port really pretty unique and I think one of the things that's a huge asset for us um, is that we purchased a short line railroad that comes in and out of Coos Bay and connects to the Union Pacific in Eugene. Um, so we own and we operate that rail line and since the time that we purchased it um, we put um, over a hundred million dollars into the infrastructure and we're continuing to to do that work to build it up. Um, Coos Bay is located about two hours north of the California border in Oregon. Um, so connectivity with rail is really, really critical for, um, for the industries that we serve with it. Um, so that's a little bit of the, the ancient history of Coos Bay. Um, there's been a lot of interest in this area. We still are very active break bulk port. Um, but actually, we in around 2006 were approached by AP Moeller Maersk. Um, the port itself owns about 2,000 acres here in Coos Bay. A lot of that is located on an area of land called the North Spit, um, which is industrially zoned for water dependent use. Um, and the availability of that type of land is growing more and more rare. So it's it's a huge asset for, for future development. Um, so AP Moeller Maersk was looking at the port for a couple of years. They did a lot of feasibility work, were really excited. And then of course, the Great Recession hit in 2009 and they decided to shift, uh, shift their focus away from Coos Bay. Um, we've also had a lot of interest in the area. Um, Jordan Cove, liquid natural gas was looking to put in a facility here in Coos Bay. They're still looking at it. Um, they've kind of pumped the brakes a little bit as far as their forward momentum, um, but that's another another potential development for, for this area. Um, and then where we are now, um, the port was approached by a company called North Point Development um, with interest, in, again, in looking at putting in a container port here in Coos Bay. And I think you know, a large driver for that is, as you said, Kim, the just insane level of congestion we're seeing in all aspects of, of the supply chain. Um, so we have entered into a memorandum of understanding with North Point um, to build out a facility. We're anticipating that um, by the end of the calendar year, we should have um, a contract penned with them and then they'll begin their permitting process. Excellent. Um, so from, from that, so you're, you're looking at, at building this amazing facility. Um, and you did say, um, I remember about the, uh, the carbon footprint and the environmental. Mm -hmm. So North Point, can you speak a bit to how yep. North Point is wanting to make this as green as possible? 
Yeah, no, we're we're really excited about that aspect because I think, you know, as you and I have talked about in the past, Kim, the industry is heading in that direction anyway. So they're really trying to get ahead of the curve. So as this, um, you know, the design of the facility gets, gets built out, they are committed to making this as green as possible, um, which is really, really exciting for us. And I think, you know, another component of that is they are really wanting to heavily utilize our rail line, like, if possible, exclusively use the rail line to bring um, containers in and out of the port, um, which is really, really great from an environmental perspective as well. Right, because you have a lot of problems with, um, you know, just container traffic, trying to find chassis, trying to find, you know, drivers and all of that. And I, I do believe um, that rail does have the potential to be a great solution for a lot of the problems we're experiencing right now. Mm -hmm. um, so, by, by being able to build this in such a way that you can um, really access your rail, I'm super excited about where the future of this is going. Yeah, I, I absolutely am as well. Um, but I mean, for, for, from the rail perspective, it is so critical. We have um, a new customer that's going to be sh starting to ship through Coos Bay. Um, and we were talking with their distributor um, to kind of get an idea of what their rail infrastructure looked like from the point of origin. And they were saying, you know, like we have a real issue right now because for every 10 loads that we need to go out, we've got like one truck driver. So if we can right. focus more stuff on rail, it gives companies other options. It gives, you know, greater flexibility, greater reliability. So mm -hmm. um, we're really excited to be able to really maximize that infrastructure that we have here. And, you know, the, the, way that our bay is set up um, is really ideal as well. It's only a 15 mile channel from to, to like its farthest reach. So we're located right on the ocean and kind of, you know, in between like San Francisco area and the Puget Sound. Um, right. Right. Um, and now for, for present day. So right now you are in the midst of getting the planning done, correct? Mm hmm. Yeah, so we're, I mean, that will really be, that effort will really kick off once we have a final contract executed. They've been doing their feasibility work right now. Everything seems to be moving, you know, full steam ahead. They're really excited about the potential to, to add some capacity in the global marketplace. Excellent. And how long do you expect it to to last when it comes to, um, you know, starting the build, getting everything set? You've got your environmentals to worry about, mm -hmm. you know, gantry cranes to order. Like, I mean, there's a lot right. of work that you have to do just for the port, not to mention all the ancillary uh, projects that have to go on on the side. Yeah, no, I mean, it will be it will be a Herculean lift for sure. But we're anticipating, you know, from a permitting perspective, that's really going to be the wild card as far as timeline, because it's so dependent on the regulatory agencies. Um, optimistically, we think that we could potentially have that work done within a two, a little bit over two years. Once those permits are in hand and we're good to go, the EIS is completed and all that stuff, um, they're thinking it's going to be about a two to three year build out. Um, and that's not going to be just the facility. So they've got to put in dock infrastructure and, you know, everything that goes along with a marine terminal. They're also going to be investing um, in our rail line to make us double stack capable, um, putting in, you know, really substantial sidings and just making sure that we can we can handle that level of traffic. They're estimating, at least initially, that we'll be looking at about a million containers a year. That's awesome, that's awesome. Um, yeah. So talking about containers, uh, so what's the largest uh, vessel you think once complete, the, the port will be able to handle? Um, we're thinking somewhere in the neighborhood of like 7,500 TEU. Okay, great, great. Because we'll be, you know, at. At the same time, the port has been working. Actually, we began this work when AP Molar Merce was looking at the port back in 2006 to deepen and widen our channel. Um, right now, we are at 37 feet mean lowest low water. Um, and the project that we're working on will take it down to 45 feet and expand the width. Right now, the, the width is 300 feet and we'll be going up to 450 feet wide. Excellent. And then, and you did say something about uh, using tidal, tidal waves or tidal. I, I'm not sure. sure how no. <laughs> tidal, just ride the tidal wave. <laughs> no, um, the tidal range in Coos Bay is, is pretty 
decent too with got you know around six and a half seven foot tidal range so you know we can bring in slightly larger vessels too if if you know we can play the tides so to speak excellent excellent i do see here that we have someone who says um that they in northern italy they're using um rail to germany austria and east europe and it's growing up oh, fast. Cool. So that's really good news on what's happening on the other side of the world. That's great. Absolutely. No, and I think we'll see that trend, you know, continue. We Historically, what was shipped on the rail line, at least, you know, within recent years was a lot of timber products, um, you know, raw logs, wood chips, finished lumber. Now we're seeing that base of business expand quite a bit. You know, we do some mineral, we do aggregate. Um, I'm really hoping we can get into, you know, moving more agricultural products as, as this progresses. Um, but, you know, even bringing in non-perishables for grocery stores now because yeah. they're having such a hard time. I mean, we all see it. You go to the store and there's empty shelves and people are wondering where their toilet paper is. So, uh. <laughs> yeah. So um, I've got a, a question here uh, from Montreal. How long do you expect the West Coast port congestion to last and what are the causes of the congestion? So I can speak a little bit towards that. And I'm going to um, share this slide that you provided. Um, so uh, what I've been doing is I've been comparing the supply chain system to a, a vase, right? So you, you broke your mother's vase when you were 10 and you meticulously super glued it back to, you know, it hopefully or as close to its original state as possible and no one noticed, right? And then, you know, a few years later, later, an event happens and you buy your mother flowers. And then your mom goes to use that vase, pours water through it and finds all the cracks. Um, so the, the water is obviously going through. The flowers are some of the, the um, regulations and stuff that were in place to prevent this kind of thing from happening, which is why you forgot to buy your mom flowers, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, we have now this, this huge influx of, of goods coming in. So you can say it, it's partly because, I mean, if water is, if the water that goes in that vase is COVID and the flowers are <laughs> regulatory measures and the vase is our supply chain, um, it's always been broken. Congestion is going to continue. It's just going to go in, in ebbs and flows, right? So we, right now we have a a serious problem with, uh, you know, people just keep buying stuff, um, especially in America. And uh, we we're, we're trying to get them offloaded as quickly as possible, but we only have about, I think it's 60, 65 births in the LA Long Beach area, and they can only go as fast as they can go. For the first time ever, LA Long Beach is now doing 24 um, hour operations which hasn't happened since I ever, I don't think, I don't think it's ever happened before. Um, so they're, you know, they're going as fast as they can. The last time that we had this kind of congestion from what I've read is 2002 when we had the, uh, the worker strike and the president had to go in and say, you are going back to work. <laughs> so yeah. now it's not a worker strike. The workers are going as fast as they can, but we do have a shortage of labor. And, you know, that labor is, you know, because they've been affected by COVID, they don't feel safe going to these kinds of jobs that are at the port. You have to be at the area. So I mm -hmm. think the congestion is going to continue to answer that question um, for, for quite some time. Um, they're looking at, you know, possibly a good, you know, year. And we do have Chinese New Year coming up, as I understand, they are going to celebrate it this year, which will give us about two weeks to kind of catch up because we won't have all this other stuff coming in, in the, into the bottleneck. Right. So mm -hmm. I think the congestion is going to continue, but it's never going to fully go away, even when it ebbs a bit. Um, so I think that's mm -hmm. something to always remember is these kinds of projects that Coos Bay is doing is would have been better if it had been built to 10 years ago, you know, <laughs> before the economy happened, <laughs> because right now we'd be like, oh, just send everything to Coos Bay. Right. We could actually like divert a little bit. But um, we we don't see that these are going to go, you know, be completely gone because you're going to constantly have a consumeristic type of culture in the United States. And these goods are still going to come in and it's, it's not, it's going to be, you know, non-perishables It's going to be refrigerators and electronics mm -hmm. and those kinds of things will always, um, you know, they're always going to be these kinds of problems. Luckily with, with your um, in, incentive measure there, Margaret, it's, I think that's going to really help 
to alleviate mm -hmm. some of this, especially when it comes to exports. So on that note, let's go into what um, exports from the Midwest can look like through your facility. Well, I think it would be a natural fit um, to move that kind of you know, those kinds of commodities through Coos Bay. I know that, you know, ag exporters have been really feeling the crunch because empty containers are just getting sent back. And so I think there's a couple different components there, like A, the cost differential between import and export, but then B, I think, you know, these container yards are so curtailed as far as space that they have available in their yards that they're clearing them out to make room for more imports to come in. So then that that um, equipment availability isn't there. So I think by the time that we get this thing up and going, hopefully there'll be, I mean, I know a lot of containers are being uh, built right now to kind of like help with this. Um, so I think by that time, there'll be more inventory on the marketplace. I think the appeal for Coos Bay is without that level of congestion, things can get in and out. So especially for, you know, perishable agricultural products, that's really, really important. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we're really excited about about that opportunity as well. Yeah, and the fact that you're doing you know what's considered smaller boats um, in the industry mm -hmm. because you're only going no no more than eight thousand TEUs, right? Um, so that's that's a mid sized boat, but those tend to go faster, as I understand right. it. Um, so if you're looking to export goods from the Midwest, you can go up through Co Coos Bay, get them loaded onto a faster boat to uh, Asia or Australia or wherever it's going. Yeah, no, I think there's there's a lot to be said for that. I think that part of the congestion issue, I mean, this is just, a, there's so many components that go into why all of this is happening, but those mega ships are really, really difficult to handle from the land side as far as just moving stuff through. Um, so it'll be interesting to see. I mean, I the trend of ships getting larger and larger has been going on forever. I don't anticipate that that will probably end. But oh, I think we got a suck. I think people are starting to notice some of the complications associated with, with that. I think you got stuck a bit on the on the feed. <laughs> <laughs> Technology, we love it, but we love to hate it, right? <laughs> yep, that's for sure. So another question came by, what kind of long-term effects do you believe the congestion is going to have on the economy? Any thoughts on that? You know, I mean, I think... I think it's, it'll be really interesting to see how it plays out. And, you know, if, if COVID has taught me anything, um, I've not successfully predicted anything. <laughs> um, so I think I think that there will be pretty ex extensive impacts. Um, you know, I think what's happening right now from an environmental perspective is so interesting as well, because there's so much focus on, you know, ooh, gl global warming, like we're seeing impacts of it, we need to do something really quick. We also know the transportation in industry take, makes up like 40% of greenhouse gas emissions. So, you know, how do we facilitate moving things more efficiently so you don't have 70 ships, you know, running their auxiliary motors offshore waiting right. to get to birth? We don't have this huge backlog of, of trucks waiting to get, you know, through the gate. Like, I mean, it's, it's adding so much more to a problem that we know exists. So I think we're excited because we feel like in Coos Bay, we can really offer a solution that's going to provide like a release valve, essentially. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the fact that you're trying to build it green from the beginning, I think is going to be mm -hmm. a huge help. You're not retrofitting, you're, you're starting from scratch, right. uh, which is great. And that's going to help with, you know, with our export economy out of the United States, as well as um, those imports mm -hmm. that come in, can come in through your facility uh, when, you know, other facilities are backed up so they can redirect. Um, one let's see one question is can't we use inland waterways uh to a certain extent to help out um do you know anything about i know a little bit on inland waterways um, i know uh, probably enough to be dangerous but <laughs> <laughs> i mean I know that they're being utilized they're utilized a lot that's you know where most ag products currently go yeah. like down the mississippi river system and um, to get exported out through the gulf it's like 60 65 percent or go out that way the rest primarily gets railed out to the pacific northwest to go out right. um yeah our, our water yeah, I mean, in, in the united states are not um you know they're they're fine for where they are but they you know they're geographically stuck where they are <laughs> that's why right. we use a lot of rail we use a lot of trucks um and that's what 
by looking at the rail system from the Midwest to Oregon, I, I think it's going to be a very easy use on, is that BNSF, if I remember correctly? Um, BNSF, UP. And UP, yeah. So they're both using the same rail there, or are they using separate rails? Do you know? No, they they don't really share rail. Right, um, that's what I thought. They each have, you know, their own system, and you can... You convert, uh, you, you cross over and that sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, like, so for instance, when we have product that goes out from Coos Bay, it goes to the Union Pacific Yard. The Union Pacific Yard also connects with several other short lines. Um, Amtrak goes through there. And so depending on, you know, what your destination point is, you can move things all sorts of different ways. So, Right. Um, so another question, is there a good road infrastructure around the Coos port? Would you anticipate drivers being uh, traffic or road congestion? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. And this is why the developer really wants to focus so heavily on rail. We do have highway system, um, state highways. We're located right on Highway 101. And then there's a number of east-west corridors. Um, from the 101 that will get you to the I-5. Our roadway system, you know, we kind of compare ourselves a little bit to, or what we see ourselves potentially being is like Port of Prince Rupert, mm -hmm. um, which is way up in Northern Canada. They're, they're fairly, they're more remote than we are, um, but they rely very heavily on rail because they don't have the highway system to really support. Um, and really we want to try to minimize the, the level of truck traffic on the road anyway, right. just for so many reasons, for safety reasons, for drivers, for, um, you know, the dreaded congestion issues, for, you know, maintaining the highway system in, you know, as great, good a state of repair as possible, so. Right, absolutely. Uh, let's talk a little bit about training now. How are you with, with um, you know, developing, finding talent, you know, things like that when it comes to what you're building? How, what's that plan? Sure. So, I mean, we're we're starting to have those conversations now. Um, we just released this information about the container terminal like last month. So we're, you know, crossing all our T's and dotting our I's. So we, I anticipate that we're going to work heavily with the community college that's located here as far as, you know, there's workforce investment boards here um, that we'll be coordinating with. So we make sure that we have a workforce that can support, you know, what we're looking to do. We think that this um, this development's going to be probably needing 250 employees, mm -hmm. um, both for rail and for the maritime side and the yard and all of that. Absolutely. And of course, you know, ASCM is always there to provide uh, more uh, certifications and, and things when it comes to inventory management. Uh, we do offer, um, you know, the CLTD, which is what I'm certified in, uh, Certification Logistics, Transportation and Distribution. So we can definitely help you to develop that talent um, by working with your colleges and working with your community. Um, so I think it'll be really good to get a forum or a chapter set up there. Um, we've got another question regarding port workers in Long Beach, San Pedro. Why do you believe we are shorthanded? Are the casualties working as well? Not sure what that means. I think, um, so, I mean, my understanding is that there's been issues with, with COVID. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's what I've been hearing too. And that not just, you know, on the West Coast, I think China, I mean, the picture that you had put up with all the ships in San Pedro Bay, there's like three times as many from what I understand offshore yeah, outside of China. So um, I think it's, it's a global issue. It is. I, I think you're absolutely right, because like in China, you know, if one terminal is found to have one case of COVID, their zero tolerance policy shuts down that terminal. So in, in recent months, um, it happened in, um, I believe it was Shanghai or Ningbo, and it was um, responsible for 20 percent of the traffic. So they shut down mm -hmm. this entire terminal for one case of COVID, which I understand and totally get it. And that's fine. Um, but that causes so much of that backup. And then um, Mm -hmm. So goods aren't getting out. And then when they all get out, they all get out at once. So it's kind of like, right. kind of like water, right? So you like stop it and you can't just trickle it out. You've got to, you know, you stop it and then you're up and then you're stopping it. And then you're up. <laughs> but I think, you know, to get back to the question we had about congestion, you and I have talked about this in the past, Kim, like the supply chain is so sensitive. So, I mean, as far as this persisting long into the future you have any number of things happen it throws a wrench in the whole deal you know like 
something right. gets stuck in the Suez Canal or, <laughs> you know, there's an outbreak of COVID somewhere. It's just, it's all interconnected. And I right. think what's really neat from a transportation, you know, supply chain perspective is people are really paying attention to this now in a way yeah. that they never have before. And it's, you know, which is exciting think, for us in the industry. I've been us. doing this for 15 years. And um, last week I was at a conference where supply chain was front and center. Yep. Not It wasn't a conference about supply chain, but it came to light for the first time that I have been to a conference because, you know, I mean, honestly, yeah, I guess to some people it's boring. I find it fascinating. I absolutely love what I do <laughs> and what I'm involved in. Yeah, me too. <laughs> right? I'm kind of a nerd about yeah. it. I saw something the other day that was saying that, you know, the new MBA will be basically like degrees in logistics. Um, mm -hmm. Because I mean, I think that there there's such a market shift, you know, there's the whole concept of, um, you know, looking at things from a just in time perspective to like a just in case perspective. Yes. Um, so that, and there's so many interesting developments in the industry right now, you know, whether it's large, large retailers securing their own vast container equipment. I mean, there's a general understanding like something's got to change and probably a number of things have got to change. And so I think it'll be a really exciting time in the next couple of years to see how all of that plays out. Right. You're absolutely right. I mean, it's, I was actually talking to somebody who was Six Sigma certified and everything. And I'm like, dude, the just in time, it was, I get it. I understand, you know, sitting on inventory is never great. And he goes, no, you're mm -hmm. right. We are, we are switching over to, you know, having a buffer. You need to have a buffer and you need to test those yeah. stresses to stress tests on your supply chain to see if, you know, how, you know, what happens if you run out of product and how long does it take you to get it? And how many, you know, how many customers do you use, lose by, you know, running out of product? So, um, you know, he's a really great, um, you know, supply chain guru. And I think it's really important that, you know, while the, the cost aspect is why so many have gone to this just in time, I've always hated just in time. And the reason being is because you have to use air freight for just in time. And I find mm -hmm. air freight, is, is very perfect if you're just in time, but it can be a huge waste of money because you didn't plan properly. And so that's where it comes down to, you know, it's really important to plan out the inventory and know when it's going to get here. And right now we're in such a state that, you know, mm -hmm. I'm actually recommending LCL shipments instead of container shipments because we can actually get on an LCL shipment. Mm -hmm. You can't get containers yeah. right now. So I think it's really, um, it's a really interesting time uh, to be, uh, in logistics um, and supply chain. Um, so we've had a couple more questions pop up. Um, there was one about shipping lines. And, and I really like this question from a person and I pronounce your last name. <laughs> I have a degree in linguistics, believe it or not. Um, it says, uh, so he's asking about shipping lines for containers and the amount of money that they're charging, basically. Um, in some cases, he sees they are not willing to solve it, and there's no global organization can control shipping lines market to protect the exporters globally. So you're right and you're wrong in some ways. So um, with... Uh, with the containers uh, and, and, and the shipping lines, so what happened is they consolidated, right? So you have a bunch of these groups now. So you have O&E and you have, you know, the Mare's line group and you have all these different types of groups that are basically we're down to eight consolidations. They're not owned by the same company, but they are sort of working together, kind of like your Delta and, you know, the other carriers that work in that. I think it's Star Alliance, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. It's been a long time since I've heard. <laughs> and then United had their own and American had their own. So they all have like these, these, you know, these alliances. The steamship lines are doing the same thing. They're not colluding, according to the most recent report. I was at a conference a couple of weeks ago and they, they did confirm that there is no collusion going on. But they are, in a sense, making up for losses they've had in the past because of lack of traffic traffic. So it's, it is a very wonky system. The uh, Federal Maritime Commission actually does a lot of investigations to make sure they're in compliance with the Shipping Act. Right now, there's an Ocean Shipping Reform Act that's up for, um, for discussion in uh, Congress. So it's important to, you know, do your research on that and contact your U.S. representatives if you're in the U.S. about supporting the Ocean Shipping Reform Act, because it's going to hopefully fix a lot of these problems with demurrage and detention that they're charging based on what was supposed to be incentivizing you to pick up your containers and re-deliver re them. But now it's, you know, 
it's just penalizing you and they're getting more money on that. So um, I think it's really important to uh, to look into the Ocean Shipping Reform Act, contact your U.S. reps if you're in the U.S. and and see and if you support it, ask them to support it. Um, let's see, we another question here. Uh, seems we can show these questions. That's pretty cool. Um, a lot of people, I'm sorry, this is my first time using this. <laughs> a lot of people prefer to work from home over the office. What kind of incentives can be utilized to help get more people into the workforce in ports? It's a really good question. I'm not mm -hmm. sure we're the right, uh, right people to answer that, except I would say stop giving them money to stay at home. <laughs> I mean, that's me, <laughs> my personal thought. <laughs> what do you think, Margaret? You know, I, it is a really good question. I'm, I'm not sure. I think that, you know, kind of like the supply chain, um, it's a really complex problem. I think we're seeing worker shortages across the board, across industries. Um, and I think that there's a lot of, a lot of things that play into that. You know, people, it changed a lot of things for a lot of people. So I think over time, hopefully we'll see the workforce regenerate itself a little bit. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know that I necessarily have any one size fits all <laughs> solution for that. Unfortunately, I wish I did. I, <laughs> I know, right? We'd be queens of the world. <laughs> um, so there's another couple of questions here uh, from Tennessee. What's the perspective for 2022? As far as congestion, I'm guessing. Maybe for where you're going, how long it's going to take for, you know, for you to get this, um, get this going. Like, where do you see, you know, in a year, what what's happening with your port? Yeah. So, I mean, as far as the container port aspect of it, 2022, you know, we're anticipating we'll have a contract in place with um, the developer. They'll be leasing port on property to build this facility. Um and I would imagine we will be in the process of beginning the permitting processes. We've been, you know, working really hard to communicate well with the state um, and regulatory bodies at the federal level just to, you know, kind of get them prepped for working with us to hopefully expedite that permitting process as much as possible. Excellent. Excellent. And um, we are starting to run out of time. When this, uh, when this is complete, what is your vision for the future in your community and the mark on the world? Well, you know, I think that um, that's a really great question. I think for us, where we're located, having a more diversified economy is going to be tremendously beneficial. Um, I think that when people see this work in Coos Bay, I think it will not only, you know, potentially drive more development here moving into the future. I think these things kind of snowball on themselves at times. Um, but I think it's, it's a good example of, you know, hey, here's how we think creatively about the supply chain and maybe it, it stems other, you know, good things happening in other areas as well throughout the globe. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the way that I look at, you know, in, in fact, one of our first conversations were, can I, you know, I had so many containers that were coming and I couldn't get them, you know, to be uh, done in time. And, you know, clients have deadlines and they have, you know, contracts that they have to abide by. Um, and so it was like, hey, do you guys have this, uh, uh, you know, function? And you were like, no, <laughs> not right now. <laughs> and I'm like, well, get it. <laughs> well, we're working as fast as we can now. <laughs> But it's funny because that is, um, you know, that is a lot of the problems that we're, we're running into um, with just the industry at large is there's so, so much happening um, and, and so many differences of practice, whether it's in my firm or it's with the ports or it's with, you know, the ships, shipping lines themselves or with the terminals at origin. You know, there's a lot of things going on. So um, I, I w I'd like to uh, to really, you know, I really look forward to where this is going and how how you're getting there. And I'm going to take one last question here um, that I think is really poignant to to something we hadn't discussed before. What is your cold chain shipment management ca capacities? Have you considered, you know, reefers and that sort of thing and how you're going to account for that? No, absolutely. So we're not currently set up to do that kind of traffic here right now. But, you know, we as uh, I mean, just 
here in Oregon, we're very natural resource based economy. So there's a lot of cold things that need to come in and out of here that are produced in Oregon. And then, you know, I think that we're, we're looking to see how we can accommodate that, especially as we're starting to work with, you know, more on the retail and like grocery stores and stuff like that, that stuff can all be moved in through reefer on, on a rail mm -hmm. car. Um, so, and I, I'm, you know, thinking that, that the, um, you know, obviously the facility that is going to be constructed will be able to accommodate that as well. So. Absolutely. I, I think it's, again, you're starting from the ground up, so you're not retrofitting mm -hmm. anything. So you get to um, experience what it is to to input uh, new technologies and, and have, you know, possibly new cold storage facilities built as well, which will, I think, be very helpful. So companies like like Cormark and others would be able to build in your area for a distribution center. So that would be a really neat way to, you know, again, it's those ancillary projects. You're focused on, on the primary. Those ancillary ones, I think, are, are very good. Um, well, we are actually out of time now. Everyone, thank you for joining us. Thank you for your questions. I see that there's so many that we didn't get to. Um, so that makes me super happy in a way because it means that people are paying attention and uh, we're very happy about that. If you have any questions, you can always reach us out to us on LinkedIn. We are both tagged in um, in this live cast. So uh, reach out to us by uh, in mail or um, you know on our feed and we'll see you all later. Thank you so much, Margaret. I really appreciate your time today. Thank you, Cam, and thank you, everyone who tuned in.